So, been following along on our Row by Row group on Facebook, and a lot of people got snow and ice and stuff on the ground. Uh, I was watching the news last night. This old uh, fella from Texas was saying that uh, them uh, wind turbines and solar panels sure wasn't doing them a whole lot of good right now. <laughs> that everybody needed some gas yeah. to run them generators. Yeah. Our uh, guys over at Dick Snell Farms posted a few pictures, and they're below, below San Antonio, and they got a decent amount of snow. Yeah. So I don't know what's going to what's going to be the outcome of this. We've had this Arctic uh, Arctic air blow in and cause some problems. We'll be interesting to see what makes it through it or not. I think it's going to be a rough year for the fruit tree guys. Um, what's crazy is so where we are, we're far enough east that it's like when that when the real cold come along there, it gets so far east and it kind of pushes up north. So we had we've gotten. Bukoodles of rain. I had a how much how much rain have we got? Enough. I had, a, I had a whale in the yard the other day. I had to kind of. I've had water standing where I didn't know water could stand. Yep. Lots and lots of rain. Gonna get more rain. We'll get more rain. Everybody's behind on the potato plant. And what did you do for Valentine's Day? Uh, I had to improvise. I had yeah. To improvise. Uh, me and Bubby had to uh, go to the store and get some. Uh, get a card and a Starbucks gift card and just kind of well you should have done what I done I just sat down and wrote a poem oh really I wrote your ma a poem uh-huh I poem. didn't know you the, uh, yes I poet. did I wrote her a poem and I give it to her and it said roses are red violets are blue my dear darling we're not going to be able to plant taters today but if it won't rain no more we can plant them in May that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Mm. She just nearly teared up on that one. Mm. Mm. I fear if you plant taters in May, you're going to be a bad shape. Well, if it don't rain, the more we can plant them in May. Did you understand what yeah, I said there? I, yeah. yeah. I got a tarp on my spot. <laughs> I, I got a tarp on my well, plot. Well, a tarp would have washed off. I'm telling you, it is as wet here as I have seen it in a long time. Now, I'm not going to say never in a long, long time. Yeah, so we hadn't got we hadn't got any of the snow and the super cold stuff. Uh, but what did happen earlier this week is, and this is, I've seen this happen here before. When you go, it can be kind of cool, and then all of a sudden it get really warm outside, you get tornadoes popping up mm -hmm. everywhere. We had, there was one in Damascus that was pretty bad. Yeah. I think I saw one in North Carolina that was pretty bad. And yep. you get some unseasonably warm weather here in the south, when them tornadoes will churn up, and it uh, makes me nervous. You can walk outside and you see it get real still, you better you better get... Yeah, get when you somewhere. hear thunder in February, you know you win in for some trouble. Um, so, we're wet. Uh, hopefully going to dry We're up. behind. We are behind. But don't feel, don't fret. Everybody's behind. Yep. So, we'll make it. Uh, maybe things will work out. We can get some taters cut up for long. Yeah, I think I'm in the next few days, I'm going to go ahead. I'm, I'm thinking if I... If I just go ahead and kind of get prepared for it, things will just turn around right for me. So I'm going to cut up some taters in the next few days because I got my tarp on my pot. It's not too wet, but I don't want to plant them before we get in another three inches or so. Well, we had several people posting about wanting to know if their onions was going to be okay, if this was going to be okay. And so I asked you the question, and I thought you had an interesting answer. You yeah, they, 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 yeah they, a lot of people were <laughs> asking me, yeah, are my onions and stuff going to be all right to eight degrees? I said, I don't know. I ain't never seen it get that. The coldest I've ever seen get here was 17 degrees a few years ago. My onions made it through that because it wasn't 17 but for an hour or two. But I, like I told him, my buddy Wes, the naked hog, he was like, should I, you know, is this stuff going to make it? I said, you, you guess just good as mine. All you yeah, do is cross it, your fingers. It, it, I mean, you get down to single digits, it's tough. I mean, I don't... I can't foresee any of them making it through single digits. Garlic, maybe. Oh, yeah, garlic, but I'm talking about the onions. But we'll see. Hope for the best. That's all you can do. If they don't, you know what? You back up, punt, and replant, and go again. That's all you can do. Yeah, you can't this worry. Don't happen once you can't blue. cry over spilt milk. Spilt milk or cold onions. Cold onions. Can't cry or dead over dead onions, right. Can't cry over any of that. That's gardening. That's going to happen sometimes. Yeah. yeah, seeds. We've been getting some seeds in. We got our peanuts came in about a week ago. We're getting all kind of things in. We're getting some beans in. I hear rumors that peas are going to be coming soon. Yeah, a uh, shipment of beans is coming in soon, so we should be get all our beans restocked. Uh, peas should be here shortly. They didn't Short. make it on the bean shipment, but they are uh, should be here shortly. So field peas, uh, once we get those in, it probably takes a week or so to get all those packed and packets and pounds and all that good stuff. Have those. I got some new pepper varieties that are coming because a lot of people have been delayed. And if, if you ain't started your peppers yet, you really ain't behind at this point because, you know, uh, 
It, it's, it's going to be a late year, folks. Right. So I got some new pepper varieties coming. I hope to have on the site in the next few weeks. I got, these are like, these are commercial grade hybrid pepper mm. varieties. Sure enough, good stuff. So I got a giant jalapeno variety called Colossus coming. I've got a really good hybrid productive habanero called Helios. I've got a giant Serrano coming. Uh, I think it's called Trapio. I've got a giant Poblano coming. Mm, that'll be uh, good. I love in Poblano. Nice big stuff in yeah. Poblano. I think that variety is called Hidalgo. And then this other one is a big long cayenne. Now around here, these the commercial guys grow it, and they call them finger hots. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But but I don't know anybody else that calls them that. I think that might just be their name. No, for. it's something that's been around for a long time. I mean, I can remember we we used to grow finger hots when I was. No man, we sold them and bought them. I mean, it was a variety we talked about, yeah. a type of, not look, a variety, excuse me, it was a type of pepper. If you look up finger hot online, you don't come up with a whole lot. Well, it's, that doesn't mean anything. Right, I know. Then we talk about finger hot, Dan, when you say finger hot, I know exactly what you're talking about. Right, but a lot of people might not know. We used to make pepper sauce out of it. Right. Yeah. So you these long, Doris, long cayenne yeah. peppers like that. Your Aunt Doris used to grow about an acre a year. Mm. Yep. Bunch of, anyway, I've looked and looked and I finally found these finger hot uh, pepper seeds and uh, have some of those. Yeah, they make awesome pepper sauce. Uh, what else? So we got those coming. Uh, transplants, we talked about too wet. I got some broccoli and cabbage that needs to go in the ground. And uh, hopefully this weekend I can get a little bit of a spell and get some things dried up to get those Ooh, transplants. You'd be lucky. I won't ever happen at my house. Really? No, I'm telling you, son, it's wet out there now. I got some spots that are a little higher. I'm talking ground. about the chickens that started swimming. It's mm. wet out there. That cabbage down the road is looking pretty good with all is this it? rain. It's going to be tough on some of these root diseases, pentium and, and other stuff. It's going to be tough on cabbage. Yeah. Anything that's planted. Speaking of that, I have seen, and, and I'm just warning folks, this is going to happen as much wet weather as we've had on these onions, I've seen a lot of disease problems on onions. That blight has jumped out there with vengeance. If you've seen those little specks on your leaves, you probably got some blight. Very well could have some more type of diseases on them, but it just comes with the territory when we have this much moisture for this long, prolonged period of time is you're going to have some disease problems. Now, it is possible that they grow out of it, but uh, blight has jumped on a little earlier than normal. It's just due to the weather we've had. And I hear you're working on bringing on some more. We have a really good line of uh, organic natural pest control products, but you're bringing along a line of more conventional stuff. We are. We are and, but not only are we bring it along, we're going to be able to tell people that we have tested it, we've used these products, and we're going to give them direct instructions on how to use them if they want to go down that road. We might even have something for that that uh, booger peak, field peak, mm -hmm. or culio. Right. Uh, so stay tuned for that. For those of you who uh, who aren't strictly organic, we might have some stuff that uh, knock out some of those bad boogers. What else we got going on? Oh, let me let's show this right here. I'm going to do kind of a circle back around here. Circle so, around. So, so, if you've been to the website lately and looked at our seed start supply section, we now have our online of germination mats. Mm -hmm. This is the 100 watt version. So yep. we have three different types. We got a 17 watt, which is Smaller. If it's a 10, 20 tray, exactly. Yeah, if you go on our website and look at either of these, I have listed on there how many of our 162s, how many of our 12 cell, how many of our 24 cell trays will fit on each of these mats. So we've got a 17 watt, that's the smallest. We've got this 100 watt here, which is uh, 21 by 48, mm -hmm. good size. So you can put two 162s on that one. Might hang off the end a little bit, but you can put two of the big trays on that one. And then we have a 150 watt that's uh, 60 inches long. Now the 150 watt, uh, it is set up so you have a master mat and then you can daisy chain three additional mats to that. So if you got a really long bench you're starting a lot of seeds on, that is really, really ideal. We also have the thermostats on the site and it is highly recommended, if not necessary, that you gotta have the thermostat with these to keep them the right temperature. Um, so if you haven't seen these, go check them out. Really high quality mats. One thing I will mention, you see that little right there? U you UL? See? UL listed, so yep. that means it is very, very safety certified for indoor growing. This is the only uh, mat that is UL listed. So there is several, if you go to Amazon specifically and look around, there is some cheap 
heat mats out there. There's a few different brands that are just dirt cheap, and they're made dirt cheap. This right here, we was very particular about, you know, our heat mat had to meet certain specifications, had to be high quality, and it's not the cheapest one out there, but it is one we could be proud to sell. One of the very few that's ULV uh, listed, UL listed, excuse me. And neat, neat, Look little thing, neat little thing I added right there to the side is some germination temperatures and germ time for a lot of different crops How about that, you that? grow from transplants. Which comes now, I said that to say this, those old, I won't call them old, those blue germination mats we carried forever, which we still use in our greenhouse, they are awesome, really good mats. We don't really want to carry two different kind of mats, and we got about 20 of those fire cell, fire cell, those blue mats, they're really good commercial grade mats. We just didn't want to carry two different types. And these new ones we got, we got a little better availability on those. Well, let me we carry them in stock. Yeah, we was not able to get a smaller mat in that particular line. So we was really interested in carrying a small mat for people that just want to germinate one tray at a time. And we was able to get these with different sizes there. And that was one of the compelling reasons we went with this particular mat here. The blue ones are wonderful, but they're more for a larger type grower. Yeah, and the, the blue ones, we've had ours for six, seven, eight, nine, ten years or so. And yeah, if you grow, if you're a market farmer or something like that, they're wonderful for you. For the homeowner, they may be just a tad too big. Yeah, so those blue mats, if you go on our website, click on Seed Start Supplies, and look at blue germination mats, those are half off. Half off. You won't find them any cheaper. They're half off, so we can get rid of them and transition completely to these because it can make things confusing in our warehouse for our pickers and packers when we have too many uh, different Fire options. Sale. Fire sales. So if you want some of those, go get them. You won't regret them. Also, if you want to check out these new sizes of the ones we have, those are awesome too. New well, varieties. We got one more thing. We one got more thing? we got some new products coming in the next couple of weeks. Now I'm not going to mention them. Yeah. Because I don't want to spoil things, but we got some exciting things going to be happening within the next two weeks. Matter of fact, the truck is carrying the product right now. So within the next day or two, we should get delivery on them. When we do, it's going to take us two or three days to get all our ducks in a row. When we get them on our website, man, I am excited about what's coming. And once we get our new, we in transition of moving things in the new warehouse and once we get all that settled we hope to have a complete line of microgreen seed too oh yeah yep speaking of seed let's go over some new varieties and this is going to be a giant themed new variety mm. uh segment this week all right these some of these giant things that are, are fascinating to me so let's go through a few of them start off with giant pumpkin so we have two varieties already on the site we have one called prize winner one called atlantic giant and I added these two recently. These are heirloom giant pumpkins. So this one here is called Mammoth Gold. See a nice little uh, mm -hmm. color on that one. Big one. Any of these giant pumpkins can get up to 100 pounds or so or a little more. Uh, the trick with these giant pumpkins, they're going to average probably around the 50 pound mark if you just grow them like you do normal pumpkins. But if you go in there and you, you kind of um, cull them back to one or two pumpkins per plant. That's how you get the monsters. Same thing with kind of the, the giant watermelon. So we've got Mammoth Gold and we've got this one here called Big Max. So both of those good giant pumpkin varieties. Another thing on those pumpkins is it's important that you keep that plant healthy because these things take a long time to mature. You're talking about 110, 120 days. You got to keep that vine in good shape, free of disease, uh, free of insect problems, keep it water fertilized, keep it vigorous during that whole time so it doesn't stress any to make that big pumpkin. That's one of the challenges with that. Right. And I've learned that the hard way. And both of these, like I said, are heirlooms. So if you're into seed saving, you can take your biggest ones, yep. save your seeds, and try to cultivate your own giant pumpkin line there you go. if you want to do that. These are great for making jack-o'-lanterns, big, big jack-o'-lanterns, but these are also edible. It's got a pretty thick wall of flesh in there. You can uh, freeze the meat and eat them as well. So good giant pumpkins there. And you can grow those amongst other winter squash as long as you don't plant another C. pepo species. So you could plant uh, some South Anna butternut and then plant a row of these beside them if you wanted to. Yep. What else we got here? Giant, another giant. Here we go. 
You remember when I brought one of these back from the mountains? Uh, these yeah. green striped Kushaw squash. Right. Now, I don't know if I can grow them quite as big as that boy I bought them from did, but you know they can get that big. Oh, yeah. Um, so we got those on there. Good eating squash. A lot of people use them for decorations, too. Real good storage squash. You can feed a large family off one of those. Oh, yeah. And then we got some more giant sunflower varieties. Man, we were, you went crazy with sunflowers. Yeah. We, would you believe we sell, behind sweet corn, we sell more sunflowers than we do anything as far as seeds go. Really? Yeah. Sweet corn's top of the list. And, we're, and then sunflowers and maybe okra after that. Okra, tomato, somewhere down there. But sunflowers are very, very <laughs> popular. Anyway, I got three new giant varieties. These are all OP varieties. Open pollinated, you say. Open pollinated varieties. And you can actually harvest the seeds on these and eat them. So we got skyscraper, mammoth, and giant gray stripe right there. So they're going to feed you bees. They're going to give you a little shade. If you want a little shade in the garden, on the, kind of on the outside mm -hmm. row there, plant your row of these. Put your little garden rocking chair like you got. Yeah, and after the blooms uh, spin off, plant you some pole beans That's on. right, that's right. This last one here is a tomato variety I tried to get for the last two years and just now got it. We have the Chef's Choice Orange. We've had that one. Uh, had that one last year. I grew it really good. If you want some nice a tomato, it kind of looks like an heirloom, tastes like an heirloom. But it's got some hybridity to it as far as some disease resistance. Hybrid? Hybrid. That may not be a word. That was close. Yeah. That was impressive. Yeah. If you wouldn't have called me, I, I know, I called you you call me out, hybrid. everybody would have been all yeah. right with it. Yeah. Anyway, we know the folks that created this Chef's Choice line, and these are all AAS winners, great tomatoes. And uh, so we have the orange one. This is the pink here. I tried to get the black, couldn't get it. But uh, Chef's Choice pink right mm. there. All right, all right, all right. So last week we talked about sweet corn genes mm -hmm. and kind of um, the differences between the variety. Lots of different varieties of sweet corn out there. A lot of people just go by the name. They say, man, ambrosia, that just sounds good. I'm going to go with that or whatever. But we kind of broke it down, the science behind it, and explained the differences between the two. Now this week, as promised, we're going to talk about actually growing some corn. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, a huge question all the time comes up is if I plant this and I plant this, will it cross pollinate or what? How do I need to keep these from cross pollinate? We get that question a lot. A lot. Because people love to grow different varieties of corn and it's understandable because there's so many choices to be had out there. Yeah. And as we said last week, the only one, the only type you don't have to worry about with cross pollination are the synergistic types. Your triple sweets and your quad sweets. And if you go to our website and hit that filter button, you can see just those synergistic varieties. Anything else, you're going to stagger the planting. Uh, you're not going to be able to spread them apart far enough on your own property for that to matter. Since Unless you got a large property. Yeah, miles and miles. Miles and miles of property. So you want to stagger your plantings or go with the synergistic. A lot of people asked last week, what about field corn? Does it need isolating? Yes, certainly. You want to isolate field corn from sweet corn. Um, we kind of dabbled in this a little bit last week. Things to consider when choosing a sweet corn variety. So if you like it really, really, really sweet, you may want to go with some of those SH2 or the super sweets, the synergistic or those um, augmented super sweets. If you want something really tender, you got that old gal whose teeth ain't in the best shape. Yeah. Uh, you want to go with one of those SE varieties. Mm -hmm. uh, you also, you know, got to factor in your harvesting and processing window. If you ain't got time to drop everything you're doing and go get your sweet corn and take a whole day to put it up, you probably want to grow one of these sweeter varieties where you've got you about a 10-day window there. Yeah. Also, you know, we've got the G90s and we got the Silver Queens. Those are those old-timey varieties that have that really earthy flavor we talked about. You know, that can come into play when you want to pick what type of corn yeah, some you want to. Like, like some that people like, I like those type corns. And we had some people commenting that said they like field corn better than sweet corn. They like eating roast ears. Well, I'm going to tell you now, I love me some roast ears. That Hickory King. Man, I love that stuff. Put it on the grill. Uh -huh. It's good. I don't know that I like it better, but I do. I do like it. 
The other thing is uh, consider is experience level. If it's your first time growing corn, I'd probably recommend going one of the standard varieties, Silver Queen, G90, Jubilee, something like that. And the reason for that is you've got a longer growing period there. They usually take about 15 days longer to mature. You've got a large, uh, you've got a little more leeway as far as getting enough fertilizer to them, getting enough water to them. Some mm -hmm. of these super sweet variety of stuff will amaze you at how fast they grow. When I say you can walk outside and watch them grow, you can walk well, outside. Well, my and watch old them saying grow. is, in this, I love growing corn. Is you can, I love to go and you can actually hear it grow. At certain times, you can stand out there when it's real quiet and you can hear it pop, hear it growing. You can leave, leave on a Friday and go camping and come back and it will have grown yeah. six or eight inches or so, seems like. Yeah. So the faster growing ones, you got to be a little more on top of your game with getting the fertilizer to them at the right time because you got a shorter growing window. You know, I don't there. know that there's any science to back this up, but it seems like to me these super sweets pop out of the ground a little quicker. They do seem, if the soil temps right, they do seem to jerk. That Avalon I planted last year, and I, it's what me, I had a lot, just me, a lot of customers and stuff say, I ain't never seen a corn just get up and go like that one did. It might did too. I was amazed at that. Uh, you know, usually once, you know, they'll stay in this kind of little stick looking stage for about a week or so, but not that one, boy. It took off. It germinated quick. It come up quick. Germinated good and quick, yep. Um, so let's get into a little bit about corn. Um, one thing not on my note sheet here, when you plant sweet corn, sweet corn is when pollinated. So two of the biggest mistakes I pe see people make when they plant corn. Long they plant rows. Two rows about 40 foot long. <laughs> yeah. Can't get germination that way because we know corn is pollinated by the yeah. wind. And then the mirrors end up looking like that old gal with hardly no teeth. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. The yeah. second thing I see is they starve them to death. Yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about how not to starve them to death. But you want to plant corn in a square block if you can. There's a little bit of leeway. It doesn't have to be perfectly square, but you want to aim for as square as possible. You want to try to get three rows, at least three rows side by side. You can do this on any scale. You could take this table right here, which is about, I don't know, uh, four by five feet, and you could plant sweet corn right here. You could probably get you about... I don't know, 12 stalks or so in here. If you just got a small raised bed, you can still plant your sweet corn in there. Just try to get your three rows stacked in there in some kind of square. Uh, that's going to give you the best pollination. And what you can do is if you got a really smaller plot of it, once you get your tassels forming, you can walk out there and get a little shimmy, shimmy shake. Corn don't lean itself well to a little bitty garden. I mean, if you got a decent sized medium garden or a large garden, it does a lot better. And a little bitty raised bed garden is not one of the first things I would plant in that type of garden. But it can be it done. It can be done. But it yeah. can be done. Um, so when do you want to plant your sweet corn? Well, sweet corn is one of the first things I kind of aim to get in the ground as far as my warm season crops. I going. have seen in my lifetime, I've seen sweet corn up, up, popping out of the ground at 28th February here. Yeah. Now, I ain't seen it much, but I have seen it happen. Yeah. It's not going to happen this year. No, not going to happen this year. What do you think the ideal pH is for corn? Hmm, I don't know. Might I, might I answer that Go question? Go ahead and educate the me. The ideal pH is somewhere between 5.8 and 6.5. Pretty good range there. Pretty good range there. Now, if you get above 7, you can run into some, some troubles. Yeah. But if you got that range in there, that's what you shoot for. That's all your nutrients are available. you got good soil, and you're ready to go grow some corn. Most crops... Most vegetables you can grow in the garden, if you're between 6 and 6.5, you're in pretty good yeah, shape. Yeah, yeah. Don't get all worked up because you're a point or two off. They some a little bit of leeway yeah. there. So for these um, older varieties, the less sweet varieties, you can get them germinating 55 degrees. Now, a lot of people have been asking, well, when you talk about soil temp, how far deep are you measuring? temperature and I said well you, you measuring where you planting that seeds so if mm -hmm. you planting your corn seeds I usually plant mine about three quarters inch deep and that's where I want to check the temperature yeah at. a lot of people plant them a little deeper than I do too and I tell people in the garden situation you get by with that in a field situation they can plant them all the way up to an inch and a half deep no, well we don't well, that's because we water them pretty strong well in a garden situation you can handle all those variables you know to get it up yeah so you can pop them up real quick so you just plant them that deep anyway so yeah 55 degrees for the older 
standard varieties where your super sweets, your augmented super sweets, need to wait to it gets on up to about 60 degrees uh, for those. S seed spacing. This is a good one here. Yeah. A now let's lot, talk about row spacing first. Row spacing, yeah, because I have, I've done some experimentation with this in my days, and some people might, um, might say that they had different results in this, but I have tried two, two foot spacing with corn. And if you grow good, big, healthy stalks, what happens is you got leaves all in there everywhere and your pollen's way up here and it don't get down to your silks real good. I had that happen, seen it happen firsthand. So I have never, I haven't since then tried to squeeze it any closer than 30 inches. Yeah. And I've done it both ways. I think last year I planned on it. It's according to what kind of mood I'm in, whether I go 30 or 36 inches. But 30 inches to 36 inches is standard. Don't deviate away from that. I can tell you that's a tried and true row spacing right there. And you can do either one. It doesn't really matter. You can get by whatever you set up for. Sometimes I do 30. It's according to how my plot lays off. Sometimes I'll do 36. I like 36. I'm kind of broad feller, and I like to have me a little room when I'm walking through there with my picking bucket. Picking you that, that corn scared me. It'll just part ways when I walk through. There. <laughs> you wouldn't think that extra uh, six inches of row would make a difference, but I, I do like uh, I do like planting it uh, on three foot even uh, with my plots. That works out good. I can get ten rows in there, which is a heap of corn. Uh, let's talk. So that's row space. Let's talk about seed space. And, and before we do that. A lot of people want to know, can you transplant sweet corn or any kind of corn? And you certainly can. You can do it in our 162 trays like a charm. Yeah, we got in a little bit of tight one time and planted. We, we Our garden we had down at the expo, we got in a tight and we uh, planted I believe it was some ambrosia corn in the 162 trays as a backup plant. And then ended up going in there hill up and planting them a foot apart. I'm talking about seeds were well, plant placing a foot apart. We put them exactly right on top of those uh, drip emitters, made some fine corn. Yeah, so you can certainly, certainly transplant now, corn. Now, if you'd have told me that five, ten years ago, I'd said you was crazy. But I have done it with, you know, I've seen it with my own eyes. Now, I wouldn't want to transplant a whole heap of it. I, wouldn't, I, I usually grow 10 times 300 row feet. And I don't know that I'd want to transplant 300 row feet of corn. But uh, if you just got you a small little plot, Transplant the It is to go. possible. It works. It works fine. I mean, transplant, you don't have to worry about that 55 or 60 degrees as much because right. you're getting them started in a controlled environment. Now, if I'm planting with a cedar, my goal on sweet corn is somewhere in the neighborhood of about six inches. Yeah, yeah. That's going to vary a little bit depending on what your irrigation si situation well, is like. Well, let's touch on that just for a minute. I have not grown corn with overheat irrigation for quite a while now. I have used drip irrigation for years for my corn. These two crops out there, well, let me, these three crops out there, you want to make sure that you grow your own drip tape. Corn, watermelons, and tomatoes. Uh, I concur completely with that. Yep. Uh, I, I would add maybe pumpkins and winter squash in there, but you can, it, it ain't as imperative as some of the others. Right. Um, so if you're growing them on drip with your sweet corn, you can get by with six to eight inch spacing because you got all the water they need right there, easy to give it to them. And you're able to put those nutrients there when you need to. That's right. Now, if you're not growing on drip and you're relying on overhead or mother nature, I would say going closer to 12 inches is a safer bet. Eight to 12, yeah. Uh, now, on field corn, you definitely want to go further on that. 12 corn, uh, 12 inches is good on field corn. The, the, the drip irrigation is just a no-brainer on corn. If you have not ever use it on corn and you do it one time, you won't ever grow back. When Even with some of these fast-growing varieties, the, my stalks are going to get six, seven foot tall. And I've got one of them tripod sprinklers, but it, don't, it won't get up that high. And uh, you just can't get water down there. No, you catch you a dry spell, and uh, you can sit there and run a sprinkler all day long, and you just can't hardly get enough water down to them roots. Right. So that drip really, really helps with that. So uh, yeah, I ain't, I don't mind thinning corn. This is kind of a little bit of a meditation activity for me. So I, with my cedar, I designed my seed plate to plant it pretty thick. I'll put my seed plate on about four inch spacing, and. Uh, I'll plant it thick, and then I'll go, once it starts coming up, I'll do me about a row a day. I'll walk out there and thin me a row and check on it. Mm -hmm. talk, and, uh, talk to them a little talk bit. Talk to it. 
yeah. and uh, get it just like I like it. Some people mm. don't like to thin it, but it's kind of a... It is. I've always enjoyed thinning corn. Maybe they're hereditary. You ready? Maybe we might have that corn thinning gene, mm -hmm. kind of like that uh, cilantro gene, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's talk about what everybody wants to know is fertilizing. You mentioned Fertilize. that was a big mistake. It's a huge mistake. People want to starve the corn all the time. They do not realize how much fertility corn takes. And corn is one of those crops, if you miss that window or if you stress it during certain times, you have what messed up. Yeah, it now, gets stunted on you. It gets stunted and will hardly never recover. You got to make sure, and as fast as it grows, you got to make sure it needs, it's got everything there it needs, boom, when it needs it. Okay, so before we do that, let's 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 talk about fertilizer and pounds and stuff like that real quick. So there's our 20-20-20 right there. Uh oh. Now, okay. Well, I'm gonna try to keep it down just one or two cards today, hopefully. Mm. We got a 20-20-20 here, which means it has 20% nitrogen, 20% phosphorus, 20% potassium. With corn, we're really looking at that nitrogen, is what we're really, really looking at. Those other things are important early. We really, really got to meet that nitrogen need. The so the water. total requirements for corn growing throughout the season, the phosphorus is about half of what the nitrogen needs. Right, yeah. So in this bag here, which is 10 pounds, we got 20% nitrogen. So if we want to know the total amount of nitrogen in this bag, we would take 0.2, because it's 20% nitrogen, times 10 pounds is going to give us 2 pounds of actual nitrogen in this bag here. So when we talk about you need to give your corn X pounds of nitrogen, that's how you figure it up. You take the percentage, multiply it by the total weight of the bag, and there you go. Some people call that units, some people call it pounds. It's all the same thing. It's the actual amount of that nutrient that you put in there. Now if you go online and you look at nutrient requirements for corn, what you're gonna run across is a table a lot of times where it says, if you're wanting your yields to be this many bushels, you need to give them this many pounds per acre and so forth. And you'll see a table out there. And that's mostly for these commercial guys. So I kind of shot somewhere in the middle there. Because it is subjective what kind of soils you got. I mean, yeah. If you got a sandy type soil, you got to put a lot more fertilizer out there. And if you got some of these high organic soils like they have up north. Right. And this fertilizer program I'm about to walk you through is, is relative to your soil type. If you got soils that don't hold nutrients very well, kind of like we do, you, you probably want to stick pretty close to this program. If you are adding some manure and adding some other stuff and you got good nutrient retention, you might come back off this a little bit. So it's, it's very relative. So looking at kind of the middle of the, the corn fertilizer recommendations, um, we're going to go with five pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet, okay? Now, people get upset when I start talking about per 1,000 square feet, so look at, we got to simplify that a little bit. My plots, which are 30 by 35, roughly 1,000 square feet. Which is a decent-sized plot of corn. Right. And then you're going, let's just assume we're going to put them on three-foot row spacing, and I'm going to get 10 rows in there. So 300 row feet of corn is the same as 1,000 square feet of corn. We're going to make that assumption. Yes, we are. Okay. So when I give these recommendations, this is per 1,000 square feet or per 300 row feet. So if you only got 150 row feet, you cut it in half. Mm -hmm. You only got 100 row feet, you cut it in thirds. Mm -hmm. You dig? I'm digging, baby. Okay. So let's go through this here first. And we're going to suggest the timing at which this is done. So let's start off here. So we're going to do... Uh, Make sure everybody can see this. We're going to have basically two, two regimens here that we're going to kind of alternate between. We're going to have our 20, 20, 20 and our micro boost. And then we're going to have our Chilean nitrate here, which is just straight uh, organic nitrogen. So when my corn plants get up about six to eight inches tall, and that won't take long with some of these fast growing varieties, I'm going to come in and I'm going to use my injector through the drip tape, although you could do this overhead, you could do it mix it in a sprayer and drizzle it alongside the row, however you want to do it. But I'm going to give it two pounds of this and one cup of this for my thousand square foot plot. Boom. That's when the plants are six to eight inches tall. Now, some people get worked up about that ratio on the injector and all that stuff. 
don't worry about that, that ratio on that injector. All that's doing is controlling how much water you're chasing with this fertilizer. If you put two pounds of fertilizer in there and run it clear, you have just given your plot two pounds of fertilizer. You might give it a little more water with it if you change the ratio, but you, everything you put in that tank, you assume that's delivered to I like the room. I like run mine on the fast set and shoes on that. Earth. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I like it. Uh, Run mine on fast too. So when they're six to eight inches tall, two pounds of this, one cup of this. Now, the next fertilization we're going to do on our first healing. And for me, with that high arch, that's anywhere between 12 to 18 inches tall on the corn. And I'm going to come in there and I'll do, uh, my recommended rate for that is 10 pounds or whole bag of this mm -hmm. per thousand square foot plot or per 300 row feet. Okay. So, 10 pounds of this side dress, we're going to sprinkle along there when we heal them about 12 to 8 inches tall. If you, um, you know, it, it, think about this, this is 15% nitrogen. We give them 10 pounds of this, we're giving 1.5 pounds of total nitrogen. Now this stuff converts really quick, so when you put it out, you expect to see the results. The next, if you got water out there on it, expect to see the results the next day. And it just works easy to side dress right before you heal, kill two birds with one stone there. Okay, so we, we did something when they're six to eight inches tall, when they're 12 to 18 inches tall. Our next step here might be a little bit relative for some folks, but when that corn is hiney high. Hiney high could be different according to different individuals. Right. You take that little old short girl that ain't have many teeth, it's going to be different than what it is going to be in you. Right, right. But hiney high on me, that's kind of what I go by. Oh, yeah. uh, this is when we do what we call laying by. So a lot of people use this term laying by around the south. And what it actually means, laying by means to leave alone. So mm -hmm. laying by refers to the last cultivation you're going to do between your corn rows. Well, the good way to put that is, is when I go in at nighttime and get my recliner after and got me a belly full of supper and I lay down there, that's the last words I want to hear from her tonight. Is I want to be laid by right there. That's, that's the end of it. Yeah. We know I'm through. You done heard enough. Yeah, I done heard enough of your day and everything. Let's lay it by lay and by. go on. <laughs> so when you leave your corn alone or you're done cultivating, you lay it by. I'll lay it by. He's that, laid by. Now leave him alone. That's right. Um, because at, at some point it gets too tall, you can't really get in there and, and or you don't want to get in there. And, and you're going to be damaging some if you try to get in there and do much yeah. after that. So when it's high and high, we lay it by and we're going to side dress it one more time. Same rate as we did before. 10 pounds of this per thousand square foot or per 300 row feet. Now, so that we did at Hiney High. We laid it by at Hiney High. Now, next thing though is when the corn... I laid mine by a little less than Hiney High. It just hit me. I laid mine... When I, I normally lay mine by about between knee high and Hiney High. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. You got a little bit of a window there. Yeah, and if you, if you go on a long weekend, you can miss that window. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, next thing you know, your corn's titty high. Yeah, and uh, which that, brings up the next subject. That's right. So when your corn gets titty high, then we're going to go back to this right here. We're going to go back to injecting with our 20, 20, 20. And we're going to double the rate we did before. So we're going to go four pounds of this and then one cup of the micro boost. Okay. And then the last one, the last time, I like to give mine one good jump uh, when it starts tasseling. I'm gonna come in here with another four pounds of this and another cup of this. So in total, what we're saying here, if you got a thousand square foot plot of corn, and this is assuming you don't hardly have any nutrients in your soil, a bag of this, bottle of this, and two bags of this is gives you all the fertilizer needs. You're yeah, need and if that. you're running a little short on this and you've got some calcium nitrate, you can't supplement your calcium nitrate. This right here. Now, I would not, my first choice would not be the ammonia sulfate we have, but you could, but my calcium nitrate would be my second choice to supplement if you had it laying there and you needed to use it up. So help me out here. So it's six to eight inches tall. We're going to give it how much total nitrogen? Two pounds. Two pounds of this. Mm -hmm. So two times 0 0.2 was what? Whew. 0 0.4. 0 0.4. Okay. Then at 
12 in 18 inches tall when we heal it we're going to give it 10 pounds of this which is how much total nitrogen 1.5 1.5 okay and then when it's high any high we're going to give it another 10 pounds of this per thousand square feet which is how much nitrogen uh, 1.5 i feel like ty ty now you give me math lists and what is that okay and when it's titty high we're going to give it four pounds of this four point four four times point two was what four point eight Point eight. Okay. And then lastly, when it starts tasseling, we're going to get four more pounds of this. It's another point eight. You add that up for me? Mm -mm. That's going to be three and sixteen. So we got three. It's not three twenty-two. No. Go ahead. You follow me here? Yeah, I'm getting there. Go okay. ahead. So we got. 1.5, 1.5 is 3, 3.4. You've been hanging around in Alabama. For I, got too my, long. I missed my decimal point. 3.4, okay. Plus 0.8 is 4.2, plus another 0.8 gives us 5 total pounds of nitrogen. So we kind of circle back around there. Yeah, on the acre rate, on, it's somewhere around 180 pounds per acre. Um, so that's how we get to that five pounds of nitrogen there. And we do what we call spoon feeding. Now, mm -hmm. some people will come in there with some real hot, slow release stuff and put that out and let us do its thing. And you can do it's that. fast release. So the on the acre thing of it, the recommendations is 180 pounds of units of N or pounds of N, 90, which is half that of phosphorus, and then 160 pounds of potassium. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people on the Robo Roadshow have been posting these soil samples where they got a high phosphorus load. Mm -hmm. If you got a high phosphorus load and your pH is in a good optimal range there, you can cut back some on your 20-20-20 on your and maybe hit it a little harder on your nitrogen to farm up some of that phosphorus. The very best crop out there to take some of that phosphorus off your garden spot is corn. By all means, there's nothing that'll even touch it. So corn is, if you got a high phosphorus load, corn is a crop you definitely need to be growing there. Another thing you could do if you have access to some good chicken litter, mm -hmm. and I love good chicken litter, but mm -hmm. if you got access to it, by all means, get you some of that and put you 100 pounds of that out pre-plant and that'll give you some of your requirements all the way around there. Till it in. It works till it way in, better if you till and it in. And it'll be broke down and be available when that uh, corn pops through there, and you'll get amazing results on that as well. Most good chicken litter has somewhere around 3% nitrogen. So if you put 100 pounds out there pre-plant per thousand square feet, that's going to give you 1.5 pounds of uh of nitrogen. That's going to release a little different what this is, but that'll be a good a good recipe for you there. Yeah. So I'll put, we'll, when we do the blog for this show uh, in a week or two, we'll put this particular program on there. And your program may vary a little bit different. Like he said, if you, you got high phosphorus, you don't need as much as this. Uh, and you can go with some straight nitrogen. Just keep in mind, five pounds total per thousand square feet or per 300 row feet, and you know how to calculate how many pounds you got based on your percentages there. And you can break up your spoon feeding however you want to. That was just kind of a general template to give you an idea of how we do it and how we like to spoon feed them, uh, to keep them happy. Mm -hmm. And, 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 um, and so not, not miss your window. Because if you, if you try to break this down just to two fertilizations, mm -hmm. you're liable to miss your window a little bit. So what you after, folks, is this right here when you get through. You see what that is? I do see it. That is Avalon corn right there. 20, that's that's from the 2020 crop right there, and that's cream corn. And I'm going to tell you, folks, that's delicious stuff right there. My daddy, which is 83 years old, that's his most favorite thing to eat. I it's can eat that whole bag. Good, I can eat it frozen just about it. Yeah, that's good stuff right there. But that's what you're after. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the end result. It ain't that's a whole lot. You just throw that in one of them Pyrex things in the microwave mm -hmm. with a little bit of butter, mm -hmm. and uh, it don't take long. I showed the frozen, so I'm going to show that side there. Yeah, You see that 2020 on there? Mm-hmm. Yep. A good white I ain't corn. Got, I ain't got but a few bags of my 2020 corn left. Well, I we got, don't have many. I had to hunt for that one. I got to replenish my supply. Um, 
few more things to talk about real quick. Earworms. Everybody wants to know about earworms. Um, does BT work on the earworms? And I think a lot of people ask this because they already got some BT. They use it on other stuff. Um, BT doesn't consistently work on earworms. What you need to do for your earworms is some spinosad. We've talked about this before. You want to spray it on the silks. Got to spray it on the silks for it to work. Now, in the fall, when I grow corn in the fall, when the worm pressure is at its highest, what I will notice is when that corn gets about hiney high, I, if I look down in that corn plant there, I can see the worms are eating on it. You need to be applying some spinosad before that point. Right. Really. Yeah. Now, in the spring, you don't really have a lot of early worm pressure, and you can pretty much wait until your silks appear to do your spinosad. Yeah. But in the fall, and if you grow in the middle of the summer, you better keep an eye on the plants. You see some worms eating on them, spray some down into that whirl of the plant there. In some spring, early crops are worse on worms than others. I've grown complete crops before, not treated them the first time, and not had the first earworm in there. And then I've had them just about eat me up. No rhyme or reason to it that I can figure out. Just some years are different. You know what? I remember growing up when we used to put up corn, we'd have that smut that what they call wheat lacoche, I think is how you say it. It's, well, a, it's corn a, smut, it's what a we call it. Delicacy in uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I ain't, I ain't seen any of that in years. And I don't know if it's because of the drip or because I do mix some liquid copper in with my insecticide every now and then. I hadn't seen it in a while either. I hadn't thought about it. But we used to see it pretty yeah, regularly. Yeah, we did. I don't think I want to eat none of it. No, I think I'm all right. Um, processing the corn. You showed your frozen corn there. We got this. These things is kind of hard to find. And some people will say, well, that just looks like a toilet brush. But this is a lot, it's a lot softer than a toilet mm -hmm. brush. It's specifically designed. To silk corn. To get this right here. Pew. Now, you give Miss Hoss one of these right here, I'll put her up against anybody. Yeah, she's pretty good at that. Uh, with silk and the corn. So we got a corn silking brush on the site. These things, you used to be able to find them everywhere at your local hardware store. They're kind of hard to find, but we got them on the website. Um, she, you got that what's creamed. We, last year, just cut some off the, we just cut it off the cob and uh, froze it that way. And then the way I've been cooking is getting my cast iron skillet hot. And I call it skillet corn. And you don't put any water or anything in there. Just put it in there, maybe a little butter, and just kind of sear it a little bit mm. in there. It's pretty good like that. Yeah, I ain't messing with that right there as good as it is. No, there ain't nothing wrong with that. Uh, the last thing people are asking about this when you were talking about your Jimmy Red last week is processing field corn and, and how that works as far as you pick it dry, you let it dry a little longer than that, and grinding it. And this could probably be a whole show, but I figured you'd give them a little bit of insight as to how that yeah, works. Yeah, the way I do it is I let my corn dry on the stalk as much as I can, and then if I, if I have to pull it, I'll let it dry a little bit after I pull it, but preferably it's just gonna dry a lot better if it's out there in that open air. Let it dry down pretty good, then you're gonna pull it. And for shelling, I have bought me one of them old, one of these at an the antique store years ago. Yeah. The ones they make nowadays really ain't worth the toot. Now, if you can find you one of them old ones. Flea market. Flea market. Up, I bought mine up in the mountains. Find you one of them, and that's what I shell my corn with. Now, grinding corn, we used the mock mill because we used to sell those, but they several different good manufacturers out there about the uh, the grinding corn in several different malls. So uh, the, the mock mills are pretty good because I like it because it uses the rock in there. As a, a when you flea market rock. hunting for that sheller, you got to be careful. You got to find an old boy that really needs some lunch money because sometimes these folks, they're a little proud. They know what they got. Yeah. And, uh, and they'll get you on one. But once you buy you one, just keep it the rest of your life. Yeah. That's what I'm going to plan on doing. Yeah. They don't go bad, do they? Well, everybody needs them a corn sheller. Yep. Let's get into some questions. What'd All right. Think? Question number one is from John McCain. He says, after harvest, would you leave your broccoli and cauliflower plants somewhat chopped up on top of the dirt to rot per no-till method? Well, if you, I got a little bit of this going on right now. So if you are doing the no-till method, um, it, this has been accelerated with the amount of rain we have had. Uh, I just went in there with my loppers and I cut them right at the soil level, just left them right there. And with all this rain we've been having, they have rotted down pretty quickly. Uh, if we hadn't been had so much rain, I don't know that that would have happened so fast. Another thing I have done is you just take your lawnmower in there and just shred them up. 
And uh, it'll, I use my flail more. It'll cut them, you know, at soil level. You're leaving all your roots in there. If you're doing no-till, that's the goal there. Uh, so, yeah, you can just you can shred them with a mower, or if you got a little time, just lop them and chop them and drop them. Drop, chop them and drop them. All right. Cypress Bayou Homestead says, a first-time onion grower from seed. Uh, don't know when they're supposed to bulb. So they're getting a bunch of rain in Mississippi. Uh, want to feed them. And their neighbor said you can't feed them once they start bulbing. It's a pretty good neighbor. He's really right, ain't he? Yeah. If you planted your onions when you were supposed to, back around the 1st of November, they get real close now to leaving them alone and them start the bulbing process. And it can vary sometimes according to how much heat we have, and it's triggered by daylight. We're and, getting close to Lev Myers. If we and ain't it's on getting it yet. close. I believe last year, if I remember correctly, it was somewhere around the last week of February. Does that sound right? It's last week of February, we noticed they started bubbling up a little bit. And I had fertilized mine one time after they started bubbling, and I really caused a severe case of the blight. So I'm not going to do that this time. You want to shut that fertilizing off when they start, by the time they start bubbling. A lot of people want to know. I think that's what she was asking. How does she know when they start bulbing? But gee, I can, I can walk. I can see the soil cracking around mine. Yeah, yeah. I can't too. But I guess the best answer to that is the daylight, isn't it? Well, yeah. You know, when you get if you grow, you in A B Mississippi, you should be growing short day onions, which are going to trigger bulbing, ten to twelve hours, probably closer between eleven and twelve. Uh, I'd say the first of March be yeah. just be uh, is a good time. But you can going. you can see you can see the ground cracking if you. Clear a little soil around it, you can tell. Or if you've been doing like me, you've been pulling some of them up to eat, you can tell you they're starting to get a little bit I mind. I got some good taste. Mm, I do too. Next question is from Slim Fishing. I plan on planting sugar baby watermelon and cantaloupe in my garden this year. Do I have to worry about cross pollination? Not with those two. Um, watermelon is uh, citrulous lanatus. That's very good, that's right? And uh, cantaloupe is cucumis or cucumis mellow, and so you got two different species there. Mm -hmm. So you ain't really worried about cross pollination. We had this question today. A lot of people ask about winter squash. If you got two different species, they won't cross pollinate. That's right. That's what I'm gonna do in my winter squash slash yep. pumpkin plot. Uh, I'm gonna grow one of each. Oh, one thing interesting to mention. We always talk about C pepo, C maxima, C machata. This one here is a more rare species called C mixta. C mixta. So you can mix the, this one in with the others mm -hmm. and uh, don't have to worry about cross pollination. Hmm. Jakushaw mixta. Uh, number four here from Jennifer Apiary. And she says, uh, do you mind doing a video on your flower seeds? What's the best for pollinators, honeybees? Now, we should do a whole show on this, but I, I let her, I'll let you give her a little preview. Yeah, we've grown pollinators in the garden for a long time. Now, these worlds of things out there you can grow for your bees. We actually sell a mix or sell more than one. We sell one called a bee mix that you can plant. Out. If I you, hear some bees mix. If, if you got an area out there that you're not going to disturb for a while, and you want to plant a good mixture out here, that's a good one for you. However, in the garden where we like to grow, the way we like to grow our gardens, we always like to grow something that gives you a byproduct as a cut flower as well. And we love to plant sunflowers and we love to plant zinnias and bees absolutely love them. I did a video a couple years ago and I think I counted somewhere close to 20 bees on a single sunflower. And plus, if you want to get in a tight and you need to go there and cut your wife for a flower or two, you got that as a backup. So you make the wife happy and the bees happy at the same time. So we encourage people to grow sunflowers, zinnias, and we got some more flowers out there too in the garden that double up as cut flowers. I think it's just a win-win situation for everybody. I would add, there's a variety that's probably not near as popular as the zinnias or the sunflowers or some of the others called ageratum. Makes a little kind of puffy looking purple flower and the native bees, not, not your big honey bees you got in your hive, but those little tiny native bees absolutely love it and it's the most heat tolerant flower. It's thirsty, it's thirsty. It, it helps to have it on drip, it likes water, but if you keep it watered, it's really, really heat tolerant and uh, not a lot of people know about ageratum. We got it on the site. And I don't really plant good. anything I can't pronounce. Well, that, that narrows your window. That pretty. narrows my window down on that one, doesn't it? Yeah. Next one from Nicholas Lee. He says, I plan on planting sweet corn and field corn this year on drip tape. This will be my first time using drip irrigation. I have the older style cedar 
that attaches to the double wheel hoe and was wondering how to use it when planting without damaging the drip tape. So just a little background for everybody that may not know here. We've got two types of cedars. We've got our standalone garden cedar and then our attachment for the wheel hoe. The standalone garden cedar has a disc opener, so it just rolls along the soil there. The cedar attachment has what they call a shoe, so it looks like this, and that's what cuts a furrow for the seed to be laid into. Um, so that cedar attachment kind of knifes the soil like this. You can't plant directly on top of drip tape in that because it'll just rip it right up. Now the first obvious thing would be, oh, let me just plant right to the side of it, uh, of the buried drip tape. But this is what I think a fellow should do in this situation. I would, and this is assuming you've got some way to irrigate it until the corn comes up a little bit. I would plant my corn as if I wasn't going to use drip tape, and then once my corn came up, I would lay, or once I planted my corn, I would lay my drip tape on top of the soil, right beside where my corn is, once it comes up, just so when you see it. And then my first healing when I come in there, Covered I'm going to turn that tape on. you got to have it on so it, it'll lay out flat. On my first healing, I'll cover up that tape. Boom, boom, done with that. Genius, genius. That, 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 I, uh, I pondered on that. I, mm -hmm. I studied on it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, all right, last one is from Larry. Hey, Larry. Lanny. 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 Lanny says, uh, great show, uh, wants to know about fertilizer numbers, 20, 20, 20, 10, 10, 10. He wants to know why we can't have fertilizer that's 100, 100, 100. Well, he also wants to know what's in these, and we're going to cover that one more time. We've done covered it a couple times during the show. But this 20 is nitrogen, the second one's phosphorus, the last one's potassium there. And the reason you can't have an 80, 80, 80 is because you got to make up 100% of what it is in here. So we got 20% of nitrogen, we got 20% of phosphorus, and we got 20% of potassium. That's uh -huh. 60% of it. Uh -huh. The other 40% is what we call carrier. And the reason that we see very few fertilizers that are above 20% nitrogen is because you got to have a decent amount of carrier in there to be able to spread them out so that you don't burn your plants up. If you had a 33, 33, 33, you'd have to be really, really careful about putting it out there and not burning up something. You, now some you, of the commercial margin guys of, use that so, stuff. Yeah, but your marginal air there is really close. That's the reason they don't do it is because it gives you a decent amount of carrier there. So if you do mess up a little bit, you don't kill your plants. In your home garden situation, it's a little safer bet. Go with something a little more dialed down. Yeah, just example, 10, 10, 10, that, you got 70% of carrier in there. Makes it a real easy product to put out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you, you start getting. I have heard of some 80 zero, zero stuff before, uh, but. Uh, you better be careful of that. You better be real careful. You crank your car up on that. <laughs> yeah, you sure can. All right, good show. Lots of good stuff about corn there. If you got any more questions about growing the corn, uh, definitely let us know in the comments. Like I said, when we get the blog post of this, we'll have that schedule there laid out, maybe with a little more um, politically correct terminology uh, than we use tonight. But hopefully everybody got that. And I want know. everybody to be thinking about this right here. This is what you have to put you up, have you some good corn to eat fresh, and then you can put you up some that you can enjoy all winter long. It's something we do every year. Ms. Hoss could tell us, how, Rick, how many bags you get out of that off a thousand square foot plot? No, I don't know. A bunch. We, uh, we could, I normally plant anywhere, a 30 by 40 is normally what I plant per year, and we have enough to eat and, uh, and put up. Y'all eat about old. two bags a week. Yeah, we you? do. So probably at least a hundred bags or so. Yeah. Yeah. Now we don't play around now. When it's ready, it's corn gathering and put up time. They don't nothing get in our way. It's time to do that. We put everything to the side and we get her done. That's right. You can't play with it. Now this ain't this ain't no play pretty. This is the real deal right here. This <laughs> is what we're talking about. Work, but it's well worth it. Yep. You get to have it all year then. Yep. Be studying on the whole time. All right. Hope everybody enjoyed the show tonight. If you did, give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Ring that little bell so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you did enjoy this video, we got some good corn planting videos right here. Two of them. I think you really enjoyed. Make sure you check those out. Take care. See you.